Today is the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our Gospel is taken from Luke chapter 12 verses 49 through 53. These are hard sayings. In fact, it's difficult to see how they can be part of any good news. So what are we to make of them? How are we to understand them? We don't want to make excuses for them as if they shouldn't be there. Does Luke have an intent that we haven't easily grasped? Let's look at the whole of Luke's Gospel. First of all, in chapter 2, he announces the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. Jesus, who is the Christ. And he brings with him peace to all people of goodwill. That's the thrust of the incarnation. And then after the resurrection, Jesus greets his disciples with the greeting of peace. Peace be with you. This is the peace of the kingdom. But there is another text which I think is particularly revealing. It's in chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel, and it describes the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus' arrest. Judas turns up with a mob, religious leaders, temple police, and so on. He rushes up and kisses Jesus. Now, if ever there was a moment in which Jesus could have been prompted to get angry and strike back, this is it. It would have been galling, offensive to have Judas kiss him in that way. However, Jesus replies, Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said no more of this he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you, day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus never sanctioned violence, either in support of his message or even in self-defense. Jesus was a man of peace. The kingdom about which he spoke was a kingdom of peace. There's no way a disciple of Jesus can say it's part of Jesus' intent when he or she uses violence on another human being, especially when it's used to supposedly enforce the good news, as indeed it has done through, been done throughout history. So this adds a layer to it. What are we to make of the history of the church where there have been appalling acts of violence in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, in the name of truth, God help us in the name of love. What's going on here? We may find an insight into that if we go back to the history of Christianity. For the better part of 300 years, Christianity stood by Jesus' command and intent to promote a kingdom of peace. Now, I suggest that they were probably helped in that, oddly enough, by the fact that they were a persecuted minority. They weren't in a position to vent their anger in violence. Although, that said, it didn't stop the Jews, the Zealots, doing exactly that. There doesn't seem to have been any intimations of such a group in Christianity prior to the fourth century. In 313, 
Emperor Constantine signed the Edict of Milan. It was an edict of tolerance. It lifted the capital status of being a Christian. From the time of Nero until the end of the third century, you were liable to be executed if you were a Christian, a practicing Christian. We don't know how many were, in fact, executed, but it was something that your enemies could hold over your head. So in 313, Christians, along with other religious groups, were free to practice their faith. Sadly, many Christians were available to fill secular positions, if you like, positions in the empire, positions of significance, positions of great power, so that the Christian community became intimately tied to the emperor and the empire. So that by 380, Emperor Theodosius I signed the Edict of Thessalonica, which said Christianity is to be the state religion. It would be dangerous to think of this simplistically However, it seems entirely reasonable to recognize from our own human experience that when we have power, we tend to think and behave differently than when we do not have power. Christians, certainly some Christians, came into a lot of power. That had to affect the way they thought. It's entirely possible I would say even probable, that that affected the shape of Christianity to our present day. The structures, the institutional reality, the authorities, how we have our authority structured, and so on. One of the truly shining lights of the Catholic Church in the 20th century was the Dominican Father Yves Congar, a brilliant man, a, an outstanding, eminent theologian. He was present at the opening ceremony of the Second Vatican Council on the 11th of October, 1962. In his journal, he reflected that Constantine was still present. The church was shaped in ways perhaps it wasn't even recognizing that had begun in the fourth century ways that were not exactly in tune with the gospel. So, getting back to Luke's hard sayings, perhaps the hardness of them is not so much that Jesus sounds like he's promoting violence, he's not, but that Jesus is sounding a warning that if you're faithful to the kingdom, if you represent Jesus, well, you will come up against evil in the world. Sometimes the source of evil will be the Christian community, shaped by Constantine, shaped by powers that are anything but the powers of God. It's a hard, tough message, which calls us, I suggest, to dig deep, to go deep, to allow our lives to be shaped by Christ rather than the historical customs and messages that have too often inhabited the church and call themselves Christian when they're anything but Christian. Jesus is the supreme ruler. Jesus is the one to whom we look and turn for our direction, for our modeling, for our way of being in the world.